Hey there, creative coders. This is Benjamin D. Whiting, and welcome back to the Super Collider segment of Null State's interactive digital art tutorial series. We are now setting sail for the second half of our Super Collider voyage. From here on out, this series will focus on completing an electroacoustic composition within Super Collider. Because electronic music in general, and even electroacoustic music, encompasses an unbelievably diverse range of compositional styles and sound design conventions, Choosing a style to focus on is a bit of a gamble on my end. I certainly do not want to alienate anyone based on my own personal musical preferences. Therefore, I have decided to go the sound art route and compose a reactive electroacoustic soundscape. The sound design techniques we touch on could be applied to virtually any genre of electronic music and, being reactive, the code generated could make for a good starting template for a myriad of interdisciplinary art projects. After all, that's what this series is about, isn't it? Great! Now let's get started. Up until now, we've made use of the dot play and the dot as synthdef convenience methods of function to generate and output our sound. These are fantastic tools for prototyping, but for our purposes, we will need some way to route audio and control signals between our synths. Some of the synths we'll be creating will provide a raw audio data, some synths will act as LFOs, and some as FX processors. There are two options to achieve this. One is to create synth defs and allocate private buses along which audio and control rate signals will be routed. This is the hard way of doing things, as one needs to keep track at all times of which signals are being routed on which buses, ensure proper order of their synths on the server's node tree, and so on. Depending on the scope of one's project, sometimes this approach is the best way or even the necessary way of doing things. However, not so for ours. We will be going about this the easy way, which is to use a library called JITLib. JITLib, or Just-in-Time Programming Library, extends SuperCollider's Just-in-Time compilation property. SuperCollider, like many programming languages specializing in live audio performance, uses Just-in-Time compilation. Unlike more traditional programming languages where one would complete the entire code one wishes to run, wait for the compiler to convert it all into machine language, and then run the program, just-in-time compilation allows for the program to be built in chunks. Processes run as compiled and remain running until they are freed by either some condition in their code or by the user themselves. If more code is compiled while code is running, these new processes are added dynamically, the resulting signal flow changing to accommodate the new code being introduced. A good way to encapsulate the convenience JITLib adds to this method of dynamic compilation can be found at the beginning of JITLib's own help file. Quote, passenger to taxi driver, take me to number 37, I'll give you the street name when we are there, end quote. Already this hints at a surprising amount of flexibility in the order of how objects and classes can be compiled and still be able to work properly. JITLib allows for an even greater degree of flexibility in synth creation and instantiation, as well as signal routing. It provides several syntactical simplifications for behind-the-scenes signal busing. Even more importantly, JITLib introduces the concept of proxies, abstract placeholders for things like synths, patterns, and tasks. These proxies allow for some process to refer to them even if nothing has been assigned to them yet. To illustrate what I mean, let's try evaluating x plus y normally without first assigning any values to these variables. As expected, this results in a message plus not understood error. However, if we were to first set x and y as instances of node proxy, We instead receive a binary op plug message. Checking each component individually still yields nil for both, but within objects called node proxies that can accept binary operators even when not currently set to anything. Node proxies also come equipped with busing and monitoring capabilities, and can accept methods like dot play even when no sound producing synths have been set to them yet. This is particularly useful if one is planning on using their inherent crossfading capabilities. Before we continue, let's boot the server. Node proxies can be instanced in any of the following ways. 1. Manually, where a node proxy is declared and later set to some source object. 2. Using proxy space.
3. Using the node proxy definition class NDEF. The first method is the long way of utilizing node proxies. The main advantages of this include one can continue to use environmental variables normally, and one can assign node proxies to environmental variables. The primary disadvantage is that it's quite a bit more cumbersome to write, as one needs to manually initialize a node proxy and then specify the proxy source via the dot source method. The second method, proxy space, allows the programmer to set up special environments in which node proxies can be stored. The main advantages to this approach are, one can assign node proxies to environmental variables, one can create multiple banks of node proxies, i.e. multiple proxy spaces, and switch between them, and node proxy creation is handled automatically, so one can set the source directly to the variable without needing to use dot source. The primary disadvantages are, one can no longer use environmental variables normally without popping out a proxy space. One cannot create and play a proxy in one instruction. This will still work like function.play despite being set to an environmental variable. One needs to separate the instructions like so. The third method, ndef, behaves much like proxy space except that all ndefs are stored in only one proxy space, so there is no environmental switching and it uses synthdef-like syntax. Its main advantages include, no need to declare a proxy space, one is created automatically when the interpreter starts. One can create and play a proxy in one instruction. This works as intended. One can continue to use environmental variables normally. The primary disadvantages include, one cannot switch between proxy spaces, so one cannot have two endefs share the same name. I've not found this to be an issue in practice, however. More problematic is that the syntax is a bit cumbersome, leading to cluttered looking code very quickly. Proxy space is my preferred method, mainly because it's much cleaner and neater to use for live coding. One can find plenty of examples online of code using any one of these methods, so feel free to pick your poison for your own projects. Let's start from scratch by killing all servers and rebooting the interpreter. This isn't a necessary step, but sometimes it just feels right starting from a clean slate. We'll replace our server boot code with the following. This allocates our desired one Gibby byte of memory, boots the server, and pushes us into our proxy space in one fell swoop. Node proxy isn't so flexible that it can return all sampling rates at once. It's important to understand that there are audio rate and control rate node proxies. If a node proxy is instanced but not given a sampling rate or source, it remains at .ir, or initialization rate. If you've instanced a proxy, have set it to some source synth, yet it still reports as .ir when checking the proxy space, then something has gone wrong. Of course, audio rate node proxies can accommodate control rate ugens, but the opposite is not true. Audio rate ugens require an audio rate node proxy. We'll be starting our sound design in earnest next episode, but for now we'll stick to a simple example that best demonstrates the ease and flexibility of JITLib. Let's set up some code that will allow us to modulate the frequency and width of a pulse wave using the mouse. Now, this is an elementary process and can be achieved easily within one synth, but as one of the beauties of using JITLib is easy modularity, let's break apart each component of our process and place them into their separate nodes. First, let's set up our pulse wave containing proxy. Instead of arguments, we're using what are called named controls. These function very much like arguments, but as of SuperCollider 3.10 provide some neat extra functionality. First, one sets their sampling rate, audio, control, or trigger, when instancing them. Arguments are control rate by default and need prefixes in order to change their sampling rate. Next, the first argument of the named control is its default value. While not used in this instance, the second argument would allow one to set a lag time, allowing any subsequent modulation to be smoothed out. 
It's important to understand that, even though no audio is being piped through our speakers or headsets at the moment, the synth contained in this proxy is running. It's being routed along a private bus reserved for tilde out. Though currently, that bus is not patched into anything, nor is it being monitored. Let's now construct our frequency module. Here we're using the vertical position of our mouse pointer to control the frequency, moving exponentially between 40 and 5120 Hz. Finally, our width controlling proxy. That modulates the width of the pulse wave between 0% and 50% using the horizontal position of the mouse cursor. You may be wondering at this point, but Benjamin, these are simple instructions that would fit right at home in our audio rate output synth. Is there any real purpose for splitting them apart like this? Well, yes, you're absolutely right, and in many instances I would assign these to variables in the audio rate proxy. In a moment, however, I'm certain the advantage of this modularity will be made clearer. Now, let us fade in our pulse wave. Dot .play in proxy space behaves differently than function.play, where the latter is a convenience method that automatically wraps the code within the function into a synth def and then instances it as a synth, Node proxy.play duplicates the output signal and routes it straight along bus 0, leading to the hardware audio outputs. Note that the signal is still being bussed along its private bus so as not to sever whatever connection it might already have established with another proxy. Ceasing to monitor over one speakers and or headphones is as simple as invoking the dot stop method, though it is wise to include a fade time with that as well so as not to incur a pop, click, or other similar audio artifact. Now, let's patch our tilde freak and tilde width proxies into tilde out. We accomplish this via either of the two operators as shown here. There is absolutely no difference in functionality between these syntactical variants. As usual in Super Collider, it boils down to personal preference. I typically prefer the first approach as one should always patch source to destination when dealing with hardware. Both can be used at once, however, to combine two patching operations in one instruction. We can make use of this handy shortcut to patch both our tilde freak and tilde width modules into tilde out. Dot end not only stops the proxy's monitor, but it releases its encapsulated synth as well, thus saving on CPU cycles. While one certainly could have incorporated our mouse controls directly into tilde out, this approach has its advantages. For instance, one can repatch on the fly the mechanism used to control the relevant parameters in LF pulse, even going back to using static values. Also, the same control rate proxies can be simultaneously patched into other proxies, which can be remapped as needed. It's up to you to determine to what extent modularity makes sense for your code. For projects that remain more or less static, it may not make much sense at all, but this can be a boon for live coding and for pieces that are subject to a great deal of dynamism. That's about it for this week. Tune in next time as we delve into sound design for our project. Annotated code for this week's examples can be found on the series GitHub, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments below, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. In the meantime, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel to show your support for more interactive digital music and art content from us at Null State. Also, make sure to check out our Facebook page and webpage to stay up to date on all of our upcoming events, workshops, and concerts. Links to all of these are in the description below. Happy coding!